There is, the answer to what I just, my questions, is on this five cent piece of paper itself. There is, well, with all good magic tricks, there should be a magic formula. There is a magic formula that is on this piece of paper. Do you know what the magic formula is? Trust? Legal uh, You came up with the right answer too fast. Yes, those are the magic words. It says right here to Andrew Jackson's right, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. And do you know what that phrase, legal tender, means? Do you know what it means? It means that if I walk into that pizza store where they're advertising that pizza for $20 and I hand over this piece of paper, intrinsically worth five cents, they have to give me that, they have to give me the pizza. They have to participate in this act of magic. Now, what I'm going to try to explain is how this magic comes about and why we do it. Why we all participate in this. Some of us more willingly than others. It dates back to the Civil War. Until the Civil War, there was no such thing in the United States as legal tender. There were dollar bills, there were dollar coins, but no one was required to take them. What makes legal tender different than the coins that circulated, than the bills that circulated before is people were required to take this. They were required because people didn't want to do it. People knew that this piece of paper was worth five cents. Why in the world should I give you a $20 pizza for five cents? The answer was that in the middle of the Civil War, the Union government was running short of money. And it didn't have the gold that was considered necessary for real money to pay its contractors during the Civil War. It needed the war material. It needed to buy the stuff. It was borrowing money and it was taxing people, but the money borrowed and the taxes received still didn't cover the need. So, Congress, after a great deal of debate, authorized the Treasury to issue legal tender notes. There was a huge controversy because people would say, this isn't worth anything and why should I be required to take it? But, oh wait, there was another aspect to this. It was deemed by its critics to be unconstitutional. They looked in their constitution and they said, where does it say that the government has the authority to print money. They looked at their constitution and the operative clause is in Article 1, Section 8. And Article 1, Section 8 that among the, says that the among the enumerated powers of Congress is the power to coin money and to regulate the value thereof. Have any of you followed the Republican primaries and the Republican candidate season? How many of you are aware that Ron Paul, the libertarian Republican candidate, contends that the Federal Reserve system is unconstitutional and that the country ought to and legally should go back to the gold standard? And he contends that the whole thing is unjustified by the Constitution. And you know, the basis for that argument? It's precisely this. There it is in his constitution, just like in mine. It says the government shall have the power to coin money. He says it doesn't have to say it has the power to print money. And Ron Paul has the Supreme Court on his side. Well, at least the Supreme Court for a while. The critics of the legal tender law in the 1870s mounted a campaign to have it declared unconstitutional. 
very much like the challenge that is being posed to the Obama administration's Health Reform Act. And we don't know how, what the Supreme Court's going to decide on the current case of health reform. We do know that the Supreme Court decided in 1870 that the legal tender law was unconstitutional. Wait a minute. So what happened to all those dollar bills? Ah, well, this is what happens to the Supreme Court. The, ironically, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, who wrote the opinion declaring that it was unconstitutional, had been the Treasury Secretary at the time the bill was passed. So as Treasury Secretary is saying, yes, we need to do it, it's constitutional. Then he was made Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and he changed his mind. But the composition of the court changed within four months after the decision, and the court changed its mind again. So in 1871, it declared in the legal tender cases that legal tender is constitutional. So Ron Paul, at this point, doesn't have the Supreme Court on his side. But a little bit more about the background. Oh, but what he also says is that this Federal Reserve stuff, this paper money, is a con game. A con game. He's right. He's absolutely right. What does, what is a con game? What is con short for? Convict? No. <laughs> confidence. It's a confidence game. And con games are designed to draw on the confidence, the false confidence of people. Well, paper money is entirely a con game. It works only if people have confidence in it. If people lose confidence in it, then they won't give me that $20 pizza for a $20 bill. And so Ron Paul contends that we ought to go back to a gold standard, a gold standard where money has real value. Except, stop for a minute, Congressman Paul. Gold doesn't have real value either. What is gold worth? Well, gold isn't really worth much of anything. If you're hungry for a pizza, can you eat gold? No, what can you use gold for? I guess if you have a hole in your tooth, you can fill that. And if you're really dying for some jewelry, then you can make it into jewelry. But other than that, you know, I guess some high-end electronics applications. But gold is mostly this thing that is set aside as the basis for, well, it used to be the basis for money systems, but nobody uses the basis for money anymore. So my first question historically is, why did it used to be the basis for money systems, and why is it no longer the basis for money systems? Do you know why gold was attractive as a basis for money? And to some people, there are plenty of people who think that it still ought to be. What is interesting what is significant about gold? And why would it be useful for money? Well, gold is rare. That helps because if things are rare, their value is relatively high compared to other stuff. So I guess gold would make a better money supply than sand. Okay, there's lots of sand and there's not that much gold. Now, why would gold be better for a money supply than say something like, let's uh, pick another element, uh, iron. Why is gold better than iron? Any chemists in the room? How does gold differ from iron? Certainly there must be some chemists. Somebody who's had high school chemistry. It won't rust. It won't rust. Gold reacts with almost nothing. Iron reacts with all sorts of stuff. So, if you had a bunch of iron coins and you left them out in the rain, for 10 years, they would rust away. If you had a bunch of gold coins and you left them out in the rain for 10 years, they'd come back just as shiny as ever. Suppose you had a ship full of iron coins that went to the bottom of the sea in 1857, as the SS Central America did, bringing, well in this case, gold back from California to New York. It goes down with 15 tons of gold. And the gold sits there on the bottom of the ocean until the end of the 20th century. When the ship was discovered and the gold was brought up, it was just as good as new. 
Now, to give you an idea though of what this confidence business is all about, there was a financial panic in the United States in 1857, very much like the financial panic of 2008. And any number of financial panics that I could and probably will inflict upon you in the course of this lecture. And one of the principal reasons for the financial panic of 1857 was the sinking, it was lost at sea, of this ship with all this gold that went down because New York's financial markets were strangling from lack of liquidity. And all of a sudden, this is a time when the U.S. was on a de facto gold standard and when the currency shrank by that much, there was nowhere else to turn. And so the panic persisted. Okay, a little bit more history. The dollar in the United States was actually not an American invention. It wasn't a British invention. It was a Spanish invention. Okay, I'm going to ask a question that will date or age some of you in the room. If I, wa uh, if I walked into a 7-Eleven, into a drugstore or something, and something was priced at 25 cents, and I, in shock, said, two bits for that? How many of you would know what I'm talking about? Okay, two bits. Two bits is 25 cents. Did you, when you were kids, those of you who raised your hand, did you do the little rhyme two, where I guess it's not a rhyme, two bits, four bits, six bits, a dollar? Okay, I am old enough to have used occasionally two bits. My father would use four bits for 50 cents. My grandmother would even say six bits for 75 cents. I have, it's been forever since I've heard that. Do you know where this notation came from? Two bits, four bits, six bits, a dollar? Do you know? You're nodding your head. Yes? The Spanish coins were called pieces of eight. And they were cut into pieces. Why were they cut into pieces? And this gets at the heart of the problems with a gold or silver standard. They were silver dollars, by the way. Um, and the reason they were cut into bits was, well, how do you make change? You make change by cutting the dollar into smaller pieces. Okay, now it usually doesn't occur to somebody if they can't change a hundred dollar bill to get out their scissors and cut it in half. There you go, here's 50. <laughs> Why does that not work for paper money, but does work for metal money, gold and silver. And if you can answer that question, you will get at the heart of the difference between legal tender and let's, we'll talk about a gold standard. What is the difference? Why is it that you could actually meaningfully chop a silver dollar, gold dollar in pieces and the pieces would be worth, if you cut it in half, it's worth half of what the coin was worth. Whereas if you cut a hundred dollar bill in half, it's not worth anything because you've destroyed the hundred dollar bill. What's the difference? The difference is that the gold dollar has intrinsic value. Wait, I said just a while ago it doesn't have any intrinsic value. You can't eat it. And you, well, you can trade it for a pizza. Why can you trade it for a pizza? Because people have decided that gold is worth something on its own. And it's not simply a representation, like that paper dollar is. The paper dollar is a representation. You destroy the symbolism, you destroy its value. With a gold dollar, if you cut it in half, you have two half dollars. Okay, from, well, the Constitution was ratified in 1789, and it said that Congress had the power to coin money. It also said, and this is critical, that the states did not have power to coin money. The states have got out of the money business when they adopted the Constitution. This is actually timely because there is an experiment in money going on as we speak. What experiment in money am I speaking of? The Euro. The creation of the Eurozone. The creation of the Eurozone is quite akin to what the United States did with its Constitution of 1787. Because before the Constitution of 1787, each of the states had its own currency. 